Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. My name is Alan Fadling, and I invite you to listen to leadership conversations that will help you to develop healthy rhythms of rest and work, and to live fuller in friendship with God. I hope this podcast will help you to overcome hurry and make time for what matters most. And now, enjoy today's episode. Hey friends, welcome to episode 220 of the podcast. My name's Alan, and I'm so glad you've joined me here. I'm hopeful that our time together will help you rediscover an unhurried way of life and leadership. Each week on the podcast, we have leadership conversations to help us lead better in the spirit of Jesus' unhurried way, the way of leadership that flows from a full soul instead of an empty one. Sometimes I'm talking with fellow authors, and sometimes I'm talking with leaders just like you who are learning to live and lead at the fruitful pace of grace and peace. And speaking of grace and peace, I'm talking today with my friend and bishop, Todd Hunter. His most recent book is titled Deep Peace, Finding Calm in a World of Conflict and Anxiety. It's a pretty timely topic, wouldn't you say? I mean, statistics over these last couple of years tell us that Anxiety is at perhaps an all-time high, and you don't have to go much further than your social media or news feed to see the levels of conflict in our time. So I'm glad to have an opportunity to share this conversation today. Dr. Todd Hunter is the founding bishop of the Anglican Diocese, Churches for the Sake of Others. He's a past president of Alpha USA and former national director for the Association of Vineyard Churches an adjunct professor at several seminaries. He is author of many books, including Christianity Beyond Belief, Giving Church Another Chance, Our Favorite Sins, and Our Character at Work. If you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. If you find these episodes helpful, would you please follow, rate, and review, and share this podcast with your friends. Now, let's dive into my conversation with Todd Hunter. On today's Unhurried Living Podcast, I'm pleased to have Todd Hunter, author of Deep Peace. Todd, thanks so much for having this conversation with me. Yeah, great to see you today, Alan. Good to be together. Well, I'd love if you would, just as we start, um, I'd love to hear a little bit of the story of how this particular book came to be. Yeah. Well, my first recollection is a couple of years ago being at a uh, a retreat with a few friends in South Carolina. And it was a kind of a planning retreat. I remember whiteboards and those sticky notes and that kind of <laughs> yeah. thing. And we were, we were walking uh, to a break because there was a, a historic little Episcopal chapel somewhere near where we were. And um, they, this group had asked me just before we left on our break, you know, well, what's your real vision for the church? And I remember literally opening the door to this little colonial, you know, chapel, this, Episcopal church and like just hearing this internal voice saying um, the church at peace with it, with the church at peace with God at peace with itself and at peace in the world. Wow. And I really didn't know what to do about it. That's kind of a generic uh, vision, but you know, when I think about it, it was, you know, the beginning of all the political uproar was happening and COVID hadn't started yet, but lots of us were becoming aware of how bad American civil discourse was becoming and that sort of thing. And even within the church. And so this, this kind of holistic idea of peace again, at peace with God. Hmm. And, you know, we can unpack that some, what does it mean to be at peace within ourselves? And then what would it mean to be at peace um, for the sake of the world or peacemaking that sort of thing? So that was the big thing. I think I was, I was already in tune with the polarization that's just become worse over the last couple of years Oh my goodness! and the civil discourse, the cultural upset that just keeps getting worse. And so I think that's probably what prompted it. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Uh, So as you begin the book, you have some chapters uh, where you talk about what you call peace killers. You have 10 peace killers. Can you talk a little bit about some of the dynamics that destroy peace in us or or among us? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I think when I look at that list of things like fear, anger, aggression, attachments, that sort of thing, um, as I was writing the book, I remember it coming to me several times. What do we actually want? Hmm. Because sometimes peace, I think, is a notional value. Hmm. Like, it sounds good. It sounds right. Like, who could be against peace, right? It's like, yeah. I'm against... anti-peace. I don't want yeah. any of that. <laughs> yeah, or it's like being against love or grandma's apple pie or something, right? Like, who could right. be against peace? Hmm. So I think it sits in our conscious and or subconscious minds as a notional value, um, kind of like, wouldn't it be nice to have peace? Uh, the way some people might think, wouldn't it be nice to lose 30 pounds? And then we don't do anything about it actually, uh, to lose the 30 pounds. So it's just, it's, it's a notional value. And as I was going through the book, I, I realized that oftentimes it's because we actually want something more or different than we actually want peace. So that's one of the big peace killers is that a lot of time what explains, well, why are we online reading the kinds of things that just makes us anxious and that we can do nothing about. Yeah. So just spending hours and hours and hours tracking down, you know, news stories and conspiracy theories or debunking conspiracy theories or whatever. And there's a certain energy that we get from that. And it actually makes us people of anxiety and people of fear. So we kind of say we want peace but we actually are living out of a deeper set of wants. So um, here you might think of James K. Smith's work on, you know, desiring the kingdom. And the sentence I'll never forget is um, you are what you want and you may not want what you think you want. That's um, powerful. And so that sat in the back of my mind a lot. Of, I think as I was talking about those, those uh, peace killers and obviously like one of the ones we talk about is fear you know, fear comes and goes in any human life, but hanging on to it and not processing it will kill peace. Or obviously there are times to be appropriately angry, but becoming a person who's fundamentally angry, well, that'll be a peace killer. Hmm. And are there times to be aggressive in human life? Yes, of course. But aggression as a basic posture in life will be a peace killer. So that's what I walk through in that first part of the book, just trying to show readers what are the things that work against the peace that we intuitively think and say that we want. Yeah, I like that uh, your way of describing that as a kind of notional value. Mm -hmm. We 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 think that's what we want, but maybe we want something more than that. Um, yeah, usually without knowing it, it's usually subconscious. Yeah, well, and and so I, I I think sometimes I've even imagined peace is more of an absence of something than the presence yes. of of something, and mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get excited about the absence of something, you know, right. in the end. Yes. So you sort of go on from the peace killers to then really highlight what you call, you know, a trinity of peace. You you foundation this idea of peace in who God is, that God, right. in fact, is, you mm -hmm. know, a God of peace. But I think, again, that, that may be a notional thing for us sometimes. What in the world does that actually look like, feel like? How does that work, you know, in our yeah. experience? Yeah. Well, I guess moving on from one thought leader like James K. Smith to another uh, who I know we both appreciate, Dallas Willard. Mm. Um, I, I don't know why I was talking to Dallas one day about hierarchy and the Trinity. Maybe we were talking about women's ordination or something. I can't remember. But I remember him saying, well, Todd, you know why there's not hierarchy in the Trinity? And I, and I said, no, expecting, you know, some brilliant theological slash philosophical, you know, <laughs> discourse from Dallas. And Dallas said, well, because the members of the Trinity would never tolerate it. <laughs> and and as you know, that was Dallas. He could yeah. summarize hundreds of pages of philosophy and theology into one little soundbite like that, which of course is brilliant. Oh my goodness. The, the Trinity having such mutual love and affection and respect, all those, that, that word group we would think of for each other would never allow for a hierarchical way of treating each other. So what I had it in mind in this section of the book about a God of peace was to help us to imagine the interrelations of the Trinity and how they would have not been anxious with each other and they would have not feared each other or gotten into the kinds of things that kill peace, but rather as beings of peace would have kind of automatically intuitively nurtured 
peace amongst themselves. And then what I had in mind is, a, frankly, another Willardism. Remember when Dallas used to say, what if the most real thing in the world is a trinity of persons who are completely competent love? <laughs> And that that's the reality that lies beyond or behind all reality. So Christians aren't dualists. We don't deny reality. Like we don't deny, you know, we, we got in a car wreck and broke a couple of ribs or fell off our bike and, you know, broke a, a wrist. We don't deny the pain of human life, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, whatever. We just know that there's a reality that lies beyond that or behind that, that is actually the most um, real thing in the world. So I think in the book, I playfully say, um, we can't imagine God saying, let there be light. And then squinting his face and crossing his fingers like, oh, I hope that comes out okay. Oh, you know, like, I hope that works, <laughs> you know, or, you know, we have these big theological categories of, of God superintending human history to its intended purposes and all that. Well, I just think it's so important that we know that the person who's doing that, this Trinitarian God is himself a person of peace. And that God is not pacing the golden streets, you know, with his anthropomorphic head held in his anthropomorphic hand saying, oh, myself, you know, like <laughs> I didn't picture the day when, you know, human beings would be confused about human sexuality or, oh, no, I didn't picture the day that um, Russia was amassing troops as we talk today, you know, on the border of the Ukraine. See, because when we picture God as anxious then we live into that anxiety. And what I wanted readers to see that, that fundamental to all creation, all of human reality is a trinity of beings. Fundamental to that being is peace. And that makes peace actually fundamental to everything that exists. We just have a hard time sometimes tapping into it, myself included. I mean, yeah. it's, we, we all have to work at this. It's not like any of us, you know, live in, uh, some sort of consistent, perfect peace. Now that's so good because that gets at, you know, w what is our vision of reality? Mm -hmm. um, which is in part, what is our vision of the God who creates the re reality in which we, we live. And this is a God of peace. Yes. That's such a yeah. beautiful vision. And, and you're right. It takes time to grow, you know, into that. So, you know, you begin with peace killers and then you work with us to have a vision of God um, you then talk about, in a sense, a trinity of our experience and expression of peace. Mm -hmm. you know, what does that peace look like as it works itself out in our in our lived experience? It's more than just sort of personal well-being. It's far more robust yeah. and far more holistic than that. Right. As you said earlier, Alan, that peace is not just the absence of conflict or it's not merely the absent of absence of war or that sort of thing, but peace, as some of our listeners will know uh, in the old Testament, Shalom, or even the, uh, the new Testament idea of salvation of Sozo. Mm. These are very holistic, all encompassing terms. And so they are positive um, forces in the world and they are positively experienced. So the, it's not just the absence again of conflict of various sorts, but peace is a real inward experience. Um, like it's something we know bodily and mentally and emotionally it's, it's an existential, uh, sorry to use a big word, but like it's, it's, it's a, it's a personally experienced thing. It's, it's not a concept like in sociology or, you know, war that like peace is the opposite of war. No, it's a, it's a very human experience. So I think I, I help readers to try to understand what would have been the inner reality of Jesus at his arrest? So as he pictures, as he sees, you know, maybe through the moonlight or starlight, uh, a shadowy figure of Judas coming through the trees and into the opening or something, wherever Jesus was standing. Um, how do we picture his inner reality at that moment? And it would, of course, been one of peace. Now, had he been would he also have been aware of potential negative consequences, et cetera? Had he, would he, had he have been aware of, I'm a, of, of feelings of betrayal, 
Yes, of course. Again, Christians are, we do not deny reality. We're not dualists. It's just that the way we experience reality is held in this um, personally experienced relationship of God that's marked by peace and joy and hope and love and those sorts of things. And that that's the inner reality that Jesus worked out of one of the biggest things that I see in, in modern Christianity and sort of modern human living that works against our peace is a sense of, uh, we don't have contentment Mm. and that lack of contentment drives all sorts of processes in us, um, that robs us of our peace. And so to me, one of the greatest invitations, um, humanity will ever hear is the invitation to be in a yoke with Jesus, you know, thinking of Matthew 11 and how Jesus talked about being with him is light and easy. It's like those Greek terms have to do with like fit or manageable. It's sort of like if you, if you buy a sport coat, two guys here on this podcast, sorry, ladies, if you buy a sport coat off the rack and you put it on and it's just ill fitting, yeah, you realize this doesn't work. And sadly, that's the way a lot of people experience their spirituality hmm. it, is it doesn't really work. It feels whatever legalistic or over religious, or I don't seem to really experience God. And Jesus is inviting us into a shared reality with him so that the contentment he had, the ability to stand at peace in his trials, uh, the ability to never be in a hurry, speaking to Alan Fadling, the ability (laughs) to never be in a hurry. Well, that came from an inner reality. That's right. That was marked by this peacefulness. And so then what a lovely idea that Jesus invites us to be yoked with him in his reality. And that little by little, day after day, practicing the disciplines um, that we actually come to take into our own reality, what was his reality? Yeah. One of the one of the little things I found myself sort of rehearsing rather often, I, I when I wrote An Unhurried Life, I, I imagine what would it what would it do in my life to remember that I'm walking with an unhurried savior? Yeah. And then this whole matter of peace, I've been thinking, so how would it affect my way, my inner life and my way of living, my way of working? If I remembered I'm yoked with a Prince of peace. Yeah. Like, what difference would that make? And it's, it's a multifaceted multi-leveled uh, opportunity yeah. to be transformed. I think. Yeah. The, the work that we're doing in our, our books that is similar is that I think what you just uh, did right there, Alan, is so important because um, Christian spirituality can often be seen as sort of doctrinaire. Mm-hmm. And I'm all for a good doctrine. Like I want to have the best doctrine I can possibly get. I want to be as, as right as I possibly can. And I want to understand the Bible as the best I possibly can and the history of doctrines and all that. Of course, I'm not in any way questioning that. But what you're describing and what I'm describing in our book is I think, first of all, evocative, it's imaginative. Mm. Like that question you were just asking, those are imaginative questions. Yeah. Like, can I imagine being the kind of human being who walks with an unhurried savior? And what would that look like if I'm always in a hurry? How, what would be the experience of being yoked with him? And how would I come to relative, you know, relative, relatively every day, a less of a hurried life. See what I mean? That's very imaginative. Yeah, sure is. Like we could do a Greek study on the word hurry and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But that's a very different thing than trying to being able to imagine and feel the evocativeness, the desire, getting back to James K. Smith again, the desire, the emotional space from which we would want to pursue unhurried living in your case, or in my case, a life of peace. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's such a helpful way to describe it. So as I'm thinking about this, in a sense, sort of this human trinity, this this experience of inner peace and mm-hmm. relational peace, and then peace as it relates just to the structures and the realities of our world. Uh, one of the thoughts I was I've, I was having is just that I, I think maybe we have a tendency to pick one and mm. make it the focus, and so maybe we're very concerned, uh, rightly so, about peace in our world. But yeah. maybe we're pursuing that from a place of profound anxiety and yes. fear. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you can talk about the interplay between mm-hmm. how peace works in us and then among us and then through yeah. us in our world. Yeah, it. Uh, that's a, a good question that I had not thought about exactly the way you put it. But you're right. 
if you think of the word grasping or getting mm. or taking, that feels different than a word group of like receiving. It sure does. Or being receptive or positioning yourself to receive. Like, yeah, it feels like those would come out of different mental and emotional spaces. Yeah. And I think that we maybe do not see the power of receptivity. And so then we take our grasping, grabbing, coveting, a normal sort of lifestyle, you might say that, you know, almost all of us have come out of. And then when we, when we attach that to our spirituality, um, yes, it can make it very hard for us to just put ourselves in the position to receive, ah. um, which is a, a very, a very different, a very different mental and emotional posture. It's it's a completely different one, and it's it's really counterintuitive for mm-hmm. how many of, especially many of our listeners being Christian leaders, they're they're not used to thinking of their leadership in receptive terms. Right. They they te- they tend to we do tend to think in terms of active terms, and that's right. Active is good, right? But it has a base, it has a foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sometimes even practicing silence and solitude or whatever, we can feel like we're doing something and we forget that those are actually things that are just supposed to help us become aware and receptive. Like they're not the thing. The thing is what they right. facilitate, which is being able to be receptive. And that even isn't the thing. The thing is interaction with God. Yeah. So you're right. It's this, this, we can go sideways with this. It feels like 19 different ways. Those of us who are doers. We're, we're always learning. So so as then we continue, you know, you began the book with you know, some peace killers, but then you also talk some about the idea of at least a couple I saw of peace builders. Uh, can you talk some about either the practices or perspectives that help us yeah. build peace within us, among us, and in our world? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do in that section of the book. And and I, I think there's at least a couple that I can think of. Um, the first one is, uh, what I call poverty of spirit, which is a really old sort of holiness. Yeah. Phrase. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw that in any <laughs> sort of popular book and poverty of spirit is really just an old way of talking about meekness mm-hmm. and humility and um, the lack of covetousness, uh, the lack of, as we were talking a minute ago, needing, grabbing, always grabbing from the world Um, Maybe the Pauline phrase, I've learned to be content in all ways, Hmm. is that's an expression of poverty of spirit. Um, And I find that to be really true of myself. The the more that I'm mastered by my desires, the less peace I feel within and the less of a peacemaker I'm able to be in the world. But when I um, accept um, limitations, for instance, or or live into that Pauline vision of contentment, then I find that it both produces a peace in me and allows me to foment peace um, in my life. Maybe the one that I think has been most helpful to me personally is the idea of Sabbath. And again, Hmm. you know, our, our listeners are certainly going to be aware of Sabbath, but I'll just say personally, autobiographically, that I remember years ago when I first started reading about Sabbath, it was Eugene Peterson. Hmm. And um, now I'm going to forget her name, that lady who wrote with Eugene and wrote on Sabbath. Oh, Marva Dawn? Yes. I would read them. And if I'm being honest, I would feel guilty. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, this is my fault, not theirs. Is it would it. tap into latent shame that I had. And I would just beat myself up. Like, why don't I really value this? Like I hear it. I know they're right. I never argued against what they were saying. I knew they were right. That wasn't the point. The point was why isn't this sort of cognitive rightness translating into my life in the beauty, the way they see it. Yeah. Like why is Sabbath for me almost an irritant where for people like Don or Peterson or Brueggemann, yeah, oh that, you know, they see this beauty in it. And I, there were years where I couldn't get it. And even if I practice Sabbath, which I guess I have m- most of my life, it was just kind of a practice because I knew I was supposed to. Mm. But what I've come to now, Alan, is what I call living a Sabbath life. Yes. So that I don't just practice a weekly Sabbath or a, a monthly retreat day away and see my spiritual director and, you know, these sort of habits. But I actually go through my day 
practicing Sabbath, which in my way now I've never said this before because I never thought of it. So practicing Sabbath has become a way for me of practicing the present moment. Yeah. So even before I got on this podcast, frankly, I just sat, stopped for a couple minutes within my day and just, you know, made myself present to myself and present to what we are going to do here. And, and I just pray really simple, what I call Sabbath prayers, like, Lord, in this moment, make me a gracious, generous, generative presence or, you know, come Holy Spirit or give me the gifts you need. So I literally go through my day practicing little Sabbaths, mm -hmm. like little pauses, even within my day. And so I love that vision of a Sabbath life, like a life that's marked by Sabbath. Um, think about, you know, Peterson's amazing example uh, that he uses in several places in his writing, you know, that story from Moby Dick. And there's that great line where the harpooners of this life must arise from stillness. Yes. And so Amber Peterson, you know, riffing on Moby Dick pictures the rowers, you know, with their great big biceps and shoulders and chests, you know, straining against the oars, trying to get the boat positioned just right so that the harpooner can stand up out of stillness, not out of toil, to take an accurate shot of the whale. And so that's become a very evocative, imaginative thing for me over the last 20 years, is that even with all that I do, how do I arise into my work from a place of stillness. Yeah. So even if it's 30 seconds, I take it and, um, uh, and just find ways to re-ground myself, re-anchor myself in, in even throughout days, not just weekly. So I've gone from kind of practicing Sabbath in that sense of seven days to trying to cultivate a Sabbath life. Yeah. Um, now again, I'm not perfect at it. Um, but another Peterson thing I always remember is it could we come to the place where we're working from a place of rest, not constantly exhausted and resting from work. Yes. Easier said than done. But man, when you can do it, it does create a whole different inner life that then spills out to others. I love your way of talking about a, you know living a Sabbath life. I mean. We, one of our little lines here has been, you know, that the best work grows from the soil of good rest. Yeah. And the, the sense of, re, of the reversal that mm -hmm. Peterson was so good at highlighting, you know, that, that, that the Jewish day begins in rest. It doesn't mm -hmm. begin in work. Right. I was having the mental image. I was picturing Usain Bolt, the sprinter. Yeah. Like, could there be a more relaxed guy on that field? <laughs> yeah. Just flying. And and admittedly, he's got stature and he's got some gifts, but yeah. but his being relaxed is one of the big reasons he could just fly mm -hmm. on that yeah. field. And I, I think that's the that's the counterintuitive gift of the kingdom in so many ways. In this case, in in the themes that you're writing about, mm -hmm. in terms of how peace would be far better fuel for our living and for our relating and for our work yes. than anxiety or fear or anger or those other killers would be. Right. Yeah. Well, so your book coincides with um, uh, an organization, I, I suppose you mm -hmm. could say, that you recently launched called uh, the Center for Formation, Justice, and Peace. I wonder if you could say more about that initiative. Yeah. Well, over the last couple of years, for lots of anecdotal reasons, I've become more and more aware of issues of justice. And I just had the vision, part of it from writing this book, that I want to take the 30 or so years that I've spent really working in the space of spiritual formation and to leverage that for the sake of justice, because using a couple of caricatures, and I, I admit that these are caricatures, but just for the sake of time, you know, we all could name young people in their 20s who want to go out and change the world and realize that the world is often very intractable. It doesn't change. Principalities and powers fight back hard. And then we all know they get depressed, mad at God, mad at the church. They leave the church. Um, often they grow up in parachurch things and then try to get burned out, try to be in the church camp. We all know that story. So I want to help people who care about justice work out of the lifestyle that we've just been describing so that I bring spiritual formation to bear on issues of mission and justice. And then on the other hand, again, this is a caricature, but for many people who have been in the spiritual formation world, it's never really been turned to anything very missional. 
mm. it, it becomes sort of privatized. Now, again, that's a caricature, but, but, but it's, again, it's, it's at the intersection of those caric- caricatures that I want to work Yeah, is help people who are into formation, see how, um, that our formation is always meant to be for the good of others. Um, the over the overflow of it is to be for the good of others and to help people who are passionate about mission or justice, but don't know anything about the formation of their souls uh, to help them know about that. So that's the big, that's sort of the big idea. And so actually those words were carefully chosen in a careful, careful order. It's a center for formation. Mm-hmm. And then out of well-formed hearts, our, our little phrase is um, formed well to love well. Mm. So being formed well to love well, to express, you know, uh, their life for the good of others to, you know, as Dallas used to always teach to will the good of others. Mm -hmm. So formed well to will the good of others. And then it's only from, um, you know, justice breaking out more and more. And I'm thinking of biblical, you know, the biblical vision of justice that it's on the heels of justice that comes peace. Mm -hmm. So formed well to love well with the hope that that would create bigger amounts of, and more, more lasting peace. So, so people who are being formed well, caring about justice, um, becoming ambassadors of peace is the real vision. I love that. And, and it makes me think, you know, peace is listed, for example, as one of the expressions of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, and so on, the fruits of the spirit, Mm -hmm. um, uh, that you've put it last almost as if to say it is a fruit of you know, formation within us and justice among us. It's yeah. it's something that grows. I, I wonder if there's anything about the book that I haven't asked you about that that you'd like to maybe uh, be sure to touch or highlight uh, before we close our conversation. Yeah, I think maybe just to underscore what we might have touched on early on, and that is that peace is not a wish dream, mm. that it's really possible because it's part and parcel of the nature of the world. And that we pursue it always for the sake of others. And the other thing I would say that it always is important with me, which becomes more and more counterintuitive as I get older and, you know, I'm 65, that means I've been in the ministry for about 46 years, but I'm still a learner. Mm. And so I'm constantly encouraging myself and I would encourage our listeners to begin with the beginner's mind. And, um, if like me, you're still struggling with issues of Sabbath or whatever. Okay. You know, uh, be a child before God, not, not some, but like, and I say this cause I do it myself to, I already said, you know, I'd listen to Marva Dawn and then it would touch the shame that was in me and I would beat myself up and you can't get anywhere that way. No, sure. But if you picture yourself as like a child who's learning crayons for the first time or a little girl who's realizing, oh, I love ballet or a little boy who's or a girl realizing they love soccer. Just think of that childlike um, beginner's mind is, um, I think, so important in every aspect of Christian spirituality, but certain if, certainly if you're pursuing justice and peace. Uh, thank you. Well, as we close our conversation, uh, I wonder if you'd be willing just to share a word of encouragement or blessing you know, to our yeah. listeners, kind of in the spirit of of what we've been talking about, what you've written about? Yeah. I think I would want to say to move towards this and work in it um, with the knowledge that peace wins. Hmm. I mean, at, at the end of the, at the end of our book, you know, at the end of our story, you think of those amazing passages in Revelation 20 and 21, hmm. the spirit that's there when God finally um, is shown to be the just one. So think of justice here, not as punishment for bad people, but thinking of justice as God's insistence that what he intended to create would come to its intended fulfillment. And when that does happen, what's there? Mm. Peace, amazing, magical, powerful peace just Mm. floods Every eschatological passage in the Bible, whether it's Isaiah, Daniel, um, Ezekiel, Revelation, any eschatological passage is washed. If you think of like watercolors, it's washed Hmm. in peace, not just peace. There's love, but man, it is washed in peace. And so I would I would encourage everybody to to picture that anything that exists exists because a Trinitarian God of peace willed it to be so. Hmm. And all of the human brokenness 
of the millennia, peace comes and goes. And it's and it's a difficult thing because of conflict and war and all that other stuff. But when God finally insists on his creation coming to what he intended to, to be, um, peace will be there again. And in those two poles of the beginning and the telos, the completion of God's kingdom that's marked by peace, we're invited to yoke ourselves with Jesus and to learn to live in peace. You know, that's such a hopeful and inviting word. Thanks so much. And so again, today, our guest has been Todd Hunter, and we've been talking about his book, Deep Peace. Todd, what a pleasure to have the conversation today. Thank you, Alan. Great to be with you and your listeners. One of the simple statements Todd has shared more than once goes in part like this. If it can be done in anxiety, it can be done better in peace. That has been a bit of ongoing spiritual direction that I've returned to countless times. I've come to find that peace is a far better foundation and fuel for good living, good relationships, and good work, far better than anxiety or anger have ever been. And so, again, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the conversation just as much as I did. Before we take our August break, we'll be sharing a recent interview I've had with Justin Whitmill Early, and we'll also continue to have conversations with leaders just like you on themes from our book, What Does Your Soul Love? I can't wait to share those with you. Now, if you'd like to receive more help from Unhurried Living, I invite you to join our Unhurry Daily email list. For 40 days, we'll send you a brief daily email that offers personal reflections from life and scripture to help you take the next step in following Jesus' unhurried way. You can sign up on our website at unhurriedliving.com. We're honored to encourage thousands of leaders just like you. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join me next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus' unhurried way of life and leadership.